to all those above me that watch over me, to all of you, my fave para peeps on this side of the veil, welcome. This is the Paranormal Ministry. I'm your host, Sean Whittington. I'm a seminarian in the United States Old Catholic Church, and I'm coming to you live from my haunted house, my very haunted house, where I live. And it looks, well, I just was about to say it's been quiet today, but there goes, <laughs> there goes the, uh, it stopped, but there, my uh, dream catcher was spinning. Oh, it's moving back a little bit. And it all of a sudden is really cold in here. And I know what you're thinking. This is like my daytime show, but I had to turn the lights on because it was so dark in here. We're expecting a huge storm here in Vegas tomorrow. It's just overcast now, but it's like right before I went live, these ominous black clouds <laughs> moved in overhead. So I had to flip on the lights. But um, God bless you all for tuning in, taking an hour out of your busy Friday afternoons to hang out with me and my guest and my co-producer. Um, I don't have a show without you guys. So God bless you all. And it is a good show today. And I know that's why you tuned in. And my guest is in the green room and I will bring her out ASAP. Let's first check the prayer urn. Carol, let me turn the light on here. Wow, it is dark in here. Carol K. from Texas. Hi, Carol. I'm getting married soon. Well, God bless you. Good for you. Coming to Vegas for the wedding. Excellent. Wish you could marry us. We are going to a chapel on the Strip. My husband and I are also planning a family. Could you pray for us? Oh, my gosh, that's a beautiful request. Carol, I almost certainly will. And... um. Let me tell you something about that. When I was an ordained, I'm still theoretically an ordained deliverance minister through a Christian university, um, but I don't go by the title reverend any longer now that I'm in the seminary in, a, in a, the old Catholic church, United States old Catholic church. Uh, now that I'm a seminarian, I can't marry people anymore. But when I could marry people, I could only do it in Oklahoma. <laughs> I live here in um, Las Vegas. So having said that, I did. I have married friends before who knew that it wouldn't be legal, but they wanted me to do the ceremony anyhow, and so we did it. And then afterwards, they went through a drive through wedding chapel and did it, made it legal and uh, all of that stuff. But um, um, I wish you the very best of luck, Carol. And uh, uh, yeah. Holler at me when you're here in town. Let me know how the, the wedding went and how you two are doing. But I will offer up a wonderful prayer for the family, since you're going to start a family. That's wonderful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God. From you, every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. Father, you are love and life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, born of woman, and through the Holy Spirit, fountain of divine charity, grant that every family on earth may become for each successive generation a true shrine of love and life. Grant that your grace may guide the thoughts and actions of husbands and wives for the good of their families and of all the families in the world. Grant that the young may find in the family solid support for their human dignity and for their growth in truth and love. Grant that love, strengthened by the sacrament of marriage, may prove mightier than all the weaknesses and trials through which our families sometimes pass. Through the intercession of the Holy Family of Nazareth, grant that the church may fruitfully carry out her worldwide mission in and through the family. Through Christ our Lord, who is the way, the truth, and the life forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, Carol. Keep me posted. And it's interesting this prayer mentions Nazareth. And I've been asked this question before. It's a beautiful little handmade uh, crucifix that is from Nazareth it was made by hand by a holy man there in Nazareth and gifted to me. And the wood is 
carved out of olive trees growing in Nazareth. How cool is that? And you can just, you should feel the, the holy power off of this thing. It's incredible. Okay. Let's check the mailbag. Paranormal Ministry mailbag. George J. from Oklahoma. Oklahoma! That's where my father was born and raised. And isn't it funny? Carol from Texas. George from Oklahoma. Longhorns. Sooners. Let's not have a fight here. <laughs> I am a school teacher in a old haunted school. Wow. Sometimes the kids get scared. School authorities do not want paranormal teams here or clergy to come in here. Is there anything I can do on the down low to help? Absolutely, George. And I'm sorry they won't let you bring some help in there. School boards are, are weird. Um, yes, there are things you can do. Um, if you, you have access to your classroom, at the very least your classroom, if you have access to your classroom when no one's around, um, I would, at the very least, smudge, cleanse, and bless your classroom. And um, that should help a lot. But let your kids know if, if anything ever happens, like if they witness apparitions or things going on, Try and bring down the temperature and the anxiety. My mother used to always just tell me, ghosts are people that just don't have a body anymore. Um, and they're, they're not going to hurt you. And for the most part, that's pretty true. I find it hard to believe that any spirits in your school would want to hurt the children. They're probably there because they love children. So I will say a prayer for you. And I don't have a candle here to light for you, but after the show, I will light a candle for you and your school and for the spirits there. And keep me posted, George, on how that's going. And I may ask, I may run this question past my guest today. That's right up her alley. If there's anything you want to know about me and my wife, my wife and I, and our ministry work, go to our website, www.ghost-b-gone.biz. And if you go there to visit, keep in mind that my wife and I don't charge for our ministry work, helping people with their paranormal issues. So I know times are tough, brothers and sisters, but if you go there to visit and you notice a donate button and you're able to do so, please click on the donate button and send my ministry in a small donation. I promise you it'll be appreciated from the bottom of our hearts. And trust me, we'll put it to good use. I'm also a certified spiritual advisor. So if you're having issues of a spiritual nature, not attached to the paranormal, and you'd like to speak to me about those issues, there's a place on the website where you can make an appointment to speak with me. But don't leave the website without navigating over to the page called the WSE course slash book. On that page, you'll find the ghost store. Lots of cool things to buy in the ghost store um, if you go for that sort of stuff. But scroll past all of that stuff down towards the bottom. You'll run into my new haunted autobiography. God, Ghosts, and the Paranormal Ministry, and I quote, scariest book I ever published. That was Annette Munich, owner of Stellium Books, my publisher. But don't let that scare you off of purchasing a copy. If you haven't done your good deed for the day yet, part of the proceeds of every sale of every copy of my book goes to support stjude.org, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, Nevada, and the ASPCA. So it's a no-brainer. How cool is that? You get to help some of the neediest children on the planet and the animals, too. You can purchase the book at Amazon, a little less expensive. But if you buy it off of the website, it comes from my office here. I autograph it, and I, I enclose it in a house blessing kit um, and send that to you personally. So... Um, that would be your good deed for the day yet. And it's a great time to get the first book. There's stories in there that were left open-ended because I wasn't able to bring closure to them yet. But God, Ghosts, and the Paranormal Ministry 2, Chronicles of an American Exorcist, the second book, comes out in October of this year. And I do give some updates and some closure 
to some of those stories from the first book. So great time to get all caught up and get the first book before the second one comes out. Scroll a little bit further down on that page, you'll see the Worldwide Society of Exorcists, which I am a founding member. I offer a 12-week online college-level course, Introduction to Spiritual Warfare, through the WSE. This is a course for all you true warriors for Christ out there that feel a calling and a longing to want to have more knowledge when it comes to drawing your line in the sand, making a stand, circling the wagons, putting up a good fight against God forbid true evil if that ever comes calling. That's the course for you. No, it's not going to teach you how to be an exorcist. That's a completely different calling. But it's exactly what it is. Introduction to spiritual warfare through my eyes. What I've experienced over many years of being in the deliverance ministry field and paranormal investigative field. Um, And it's a course like none other that you will take out there. You can enroll in the course on the website, but if you'd like more information before making that type of commitment, there is a Worldwide Society of Exorcists Facebook page. Go there, read about the course, or call me. Send me a message. I'm approachable. Uh, I'm easy to get a hold of, easy to find, and we can talk about the course and see if it's right for you. Most importantly, please keep all of my former, current, and future students in your prayers. And remember, all my students that graduate get a stunning diploma, certificate of completion, suited for framing, along with some other very special blessed gifts that you can only get from yours truly. Okay, the moment of truth, the reason why you all tuned in. You all know her, you all love her, as I do. Paranormal authority, talented, gifted author, Talented, gifted, paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, ghost buster, you name it. Um, it's got her own shows. Uh, and the, the resume, the list in the resume of her accomplishments goes on and on and on. Brothers and sisters, please, let's give a warm paranormal ministry family welcome to the one and only, the good Dr. Heather Lee Landon. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I, you know what? I'm blessed. And uh, you look very pretty today. You sound great. Thank you. Great. Um, I know what I wanted to ask you. And this is a weird reason why I would think of you. But I thought about you the other day because, you know what? We'll try, we'll, this is not so much paranormal, but we'll try not to get too conspiracy theory-ish here because I've had episodes of mine getting taken down. <laughs> Sometimes from uh, from <laughs> Facebook or YouTube, yeah. So, <laughs> without getting too conspiracy theory ish, I know you caught COVID late last mm-hmm. year. Yep. And it you even had to cancel a surgery that you had scheduled. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I still have friends catching COVID and dying. Not not even my age or older. Some younger, a lot healthier than I am. Um. So people are still catching it. People are still dying. Some of the people I know that have caught it like two or three times, and they say you're supposed to have this herd immunity by then, and it's not going to be worse. Every time they get it, it's worse. And I've even had some friends that are now got this, what they call long-term COVID, where they, they don't test positive for it any longer, and technically they're over it, but they still suffer these long-term side effects from it. So I want to know how you're doing after having COVID, if you ended up rescheduling your surgery, and what's your, as as a doctor, and I know you're not a medical doctor, but as a doctor, close enough, um, your take on this whole, and I'm vaccinated, but I'm mm-hmm. not going to get it anymore. I did the one and the two boosters, so did the wife, three-time cancer survivor. I was scared to death for her, and worked six days a week, so up to sundown. Mm-hmm. So we got vaccinated, but she still wears a mask at work in an animal hospital. And if I go out, I do, but I don't judge anybody if they don't. Um, but it, it is times are weird right now. Mm-hmm. And now I'll throw it to you. 
Yeah. Um, well, I had it probably, I want to say maybe a little longer than a week, maybe like eight or nine days. It was very short lived. We, we think my husband was in the hospital getting a blood transfusion. And then my son was also in the hospital for um, his depression issues. And they both came home. And within three days of them coming home, we all got it. Wow. So one of them picked it up somewhere in their, you know, in their hospital stay. So we're at least we're assuming because we were always, I had more antibacterial hand sanitizer than anyone needed even before COVID hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when it was, when it was out of stock, I, I had plenty. <laughs> that wasn't a problem for us. So I'm always a firm believer of, you know, as long as you wash your hands, you're careful you know, we don't wear masks unless it's like a heavy crowded area where you can't get away from someone. But if it's an open area, um, but if people wear them, you know, we understand, you know, my mom still wears it when she goes out in public because she's older. Um, my dad just doesn't go in public anymore. And but, you know, then you have Florida is a little bit more liberal than Nevada was because we moved during the height of everybody wearing it and having to wear it in Nevada. And when we got to Florida, it was like, oh, nope, it's optional and nobody was wearing them. So, and it was a mild strand, we were told, that we had when they tested us. And we're all vaccinated. So who knows what happened with that. Uh, my surgery did get canceled, um, but we did end up rescheduling it. I had it December 16th. Oh, well, God bless you. How'd yes. that go? It went really well. Uh, I'm still fighting with some pain and some discomfort. But other than that, it went, I feel I'm recovering faster from this one than I did the one that I did two years ago. Wow, I'm glad you finally got that rescheduled. That's important. Um, so, without us getting too conspiracy theory ish here, you know, we're in the, my wife and I are in the medical field. I know it's the animal care industry, but mm -hmm. we've been, both have been in the animal care industry most of our adult lives. And the doctors that were all around wear masks. Mm -hmm. And you hear stories about the masks don't work, you hear stories about, you know, um, the vaccines now aren't nearly as effective as they tried to make us believe in the beginning, but I believe there was some efficacy there mm -hmm. with them. That's why we got them. Like, like I said, we were, I'm 63. My wife is 76 uh, or let me see. She's 16 years older than me is whatever the, the math is there. <laughs> but so we were, we were afraid and we had friends getting sick and dying. So we got the shot and the two boosters, but we see so many people having a lot of side effects, even from the vaccine. So we're not going to, we're not going to get any more. We're done with the vaccines, but we're still mm -hmm. very careful. But what do you think about all of this without us getting too crazy here or political? And let me just throw in, uh, if, if my wife and I could handle the humidity, we'd move to Florida too, because I love DeSantis. Yep. And, that, and then I'll shut up now on the political yep. stuff. And it's 88 here today. <laughs> And it's not even 50 here, and we're going to get a big storm tomorrow, and it's snowing in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> 27 degrees. Thank you very much. Oh, I that's right. That. He's in Colorado. In, in a few guy, days, we'll be in the 90s. So You know, you know that, that, that place where they, they, uh, you know, they film The Shining? Mm -hmm. That's where Zach lives. Okay. <laughs> not no, literally, but me. Colorado. Yeah, I don't know how he does it. Colorado. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, Doctor but, Doctor Landon, uh, what do you think about all this craziness? I, what would you advise to somebody who maybe hasn't gotten the vaccine yet, um, doesn't know if they should wear a mask or not, a little nervous about going out, still goes out but tries to avoid being in big, you know, as mm -hmm. they call it, s spreader situations? Right. Um, what do you think? I just always, you know, like with the paranormal field, I always tell people go with your gut. And also, you know, of course, talk to your doctor, you know, everybody's situation is different, you know, um, kind of just go with how you feel. If you, you know, I don't want people to become homebound because I think that's not healthy either, um, but they need to be careful, of course. I mean, to me, I, I'm trying to figure out how to wear this without going <laughs> down that rabbit hole, <laughs> but it, it, it essentially, I view it personally similar to the flu. When the flu first started affecting people in the world, it was deadly. It was, you know, out of the blue, they didn't know how to control it. And then now you have today we have COVID that was like that in the beginning. And it's, you know, eventually I would like to say, I hope 
that everything calms down and it's no more worse than the flu. But my cousin, I did find out she had a really bad case just recently and now she has long-term breathing problems caused by it. So, I mean, it's, I think it depends on the strand, your health before you get it and also, you know, your lifestyle. Yeah. And, and it's funny you bring that up uh, cause we were also just my wife and I both together, we see the same doctor. She's, she's a wonderful doctor and mm -hmm. we make our appointments back to back. So we go in together and as soon as she's done seeing my wife, my wife sits down, I get up, get on the table and then she sees me, mm -hmm. but we went there and everybody's there, uh, the staff, the doctors, they're still wearing masks. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, we went up to, she was either, she was dressed like a nurse, but she was either a receptionist or a nurse, but working the desk had checked us in. And my wife was having a hard time keeping her mask up above her nose. And my wife, since she had the tongue cancer, her speech is still a little bit off. Mm -hmm. So when she was trying to talk, she said something and the lady didn't understand her. So my wife pulled the mask down and she goes, you know, after you're done saying what you got to say, put it back on. You want to keep that mask on. I was in the hospital eight months. Now, this is a woman that's in the medical field, a lot younger mm -hmm. than us, looks healthy. But she yeah. talked, told us a story about having been in the hospital for eight months with a bad COVID case. Mm -hmm. And she's still suffering what they call this long term COVID. And she said that's you don't want it. So it's brutal. So mm -hmm. after you're done talking to me, pull that that thing back up. So, you know, it, yeah. we'll get off of it now. Cause um, <laughs> it, it's something you always got to talk about. It always comes up. <laughs> yeah. In conversation um, lately. <laughs> well, I'm glad you, you, you look great. You sound great. I'm glad you're healthy and glad everything's going good. Rest of the family doing good. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Yep. I've got some questions here that some of your fans and followers have sent in and I'm trying to get better at, doing that now because normally i just start <laughs> talk sometimes i don't even know what i'm going to talk to you about when you come on and the conversation goes off somewhere else mm -hmm. and i don't look at the chat room i don't look at the questions people sent in and so i feel bad afterwards but so here's some of your fans want to know how was your valentine's day <laughs> quiet actually <laughs> yeah do you, do, do you do the whole Valentine's Day thing? I mean, I remember back in the day as a joke, one time I grabbed a little, I went to the Halloween store and I bought a little bow and arrow and uh, I just put on a diaper and some fake wings and had my arrow and I <laughs> came walking in with breakfast in bed to my wife one Valentine's Day morning. It didn't go, it didn't have nearly the effect I thought it would have. And uh, so I, I never did that again. But uh, do you go for the whole that is a picture I am not going to be able to get out of my head for the next couple of days. As I was as gone. as I was suffering a quick bout of diarrhea of the mouth, <laughs> and I was even telling that story. I'm like, "Why are you telling wow. the other me? I have two me's. The other me was telling me, "Why are you telling this story?" So, um, so you're the guy I saw on Fremont Street when I was there last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, a guy. That's funny you bring that up because a guy who hires. Uh, celebrity lookalikes to wander the Fremont mm -hmm. Street and, and get money, you know, take pictures with you for however much they charge. He called me up and he saw my show somewhere or somewhere he saw me and he called me up and wanted me for this. And I'm like, who, who, who does he want me to, who does he want me to be? Probably Bruce Willis, maybe Burt Reynolds. <laughs> the guy wanted me to be the dude from the guy with the baby in the, on his chest from like the what the what is that movie? He's got hangover. a big beard. He's a comedian. Yeah, The Hangover. Yeah, you wanted me to be that guy. I'm like, <laughs> okay. It never happened. It never it ended up coming through. But you know, it's so funny how some people will look at you like I have close friends that think I remind them of Danny DeVito. And I don't see myself that way. I'm I'm okay with it. But it's funny how other people, you look at yourself completely mm -hmm. different than how people, other people look at you. And I just, I find that amazing. But so this is my question now, because somebody called you, sent in a Valentine's Day question. And I've had, I've had cases like this before. And because, you know, I'm a, not really a board certified psychologist or psychiatrist. And I'm also know the legalities of when somebody reaches out to me with a paranormal issue, if they're already under the care of a physician and being clinically diagnosed, 
with a mental illness, my hands are tied. I can't proceed. Mm -hmm. I, I advise them, continue to see your doctor, stay on your meds, and I'm here for you to talk anytime you want. But legally, you can't proceed right. with going into the paranormal stuff with them. It's sad, but um, I've had people reach out to me who are having love affairs with ghosts. Like, I remember this one guy reached out to me, and he said, you know, I'm a psychic medium, and I've had the spirit of a, of a wife from a previous life with me all this on um, this life of mine with me. And I got into ghost hunting and I went to a place and she's, she, you know, I'm going to be good on the language here. She's a little, whatever he's, you know, you know what he called her. And she invited some ghost of a pissed off miner at some haunted location to come home with us. So now that ghost is here and it's beating me up and attacking me because he wants my ex wife from a former life all to himself. Can you come over and get rid of him? I don't want you to get rid of my ex-wife from a previous life. I just want you to get rid of the bad ghost. And then I have people that have called me up say, wanting to know, is this healthy or not healthy? I'm having the most wonderful love affair, men and women, mm -hmm. uh, with a ghost. And first of all, I always question that because when it gets that far, I really honestly in my heart of hearts believe there's something more malevolent and darker going on. They're being tricked. Um, but have, has that ever happened to you? And what do you think about these? Like there's a famous woman right now in, in touring Europe who talks about her marrying her ghost. Mm -hmm. And she's got this, she says, I'm, my husband's with me and I'm married to a ghost. What do you think about all of that? I, it's interesting. I've never encountered that as far as a client or anything that I've encountered personally, but I do have to agree with you. It, to me, something along those lines is similar to the children's spirits. You know, they're pretending to be something that they're not. And it's not in all cases, but I would say majority of the cases until you're completely comfortable. And then that's when it turns and you're calling an exorcist or needing, you know, more help than you normally need. And with the one with the, uh, the pissed off minor, <laughs> I mean, could that be the other side of his wife from a previous life that is hey, now turning on him uh all i know is that i told him i you know everybody's got to go she's mm -hmm. a troublemaker this new um hitchhiking ghost that followed you guys home is a is a troublemaker and i said and you need to rethink i said you need to rethink if you are truly a psychic medium and i don't have no reason to believe that you're lying to me you need to rethink the whole ghost hunting thing i believe that if you know that you are truly gifted psychic medium trance medium or anything like that or or ghost hunting probably unless you are really really skilled at it and really really passionate about it I would think you might want to be careful doing that because you are, we're all targets anyhow when we go out there mm -hmm. working cases, but especially when you are a really gifted, open psychic medium that mm -hmm. doesn't maybe know how to turn it on or off or protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I advised them to do. I said, I'll come over, but everybody's got to go. And you and I have to have a big sit down about where you're at with your gifts and maybe rethinking this whole ghost hunting thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, I, I I don't want to say don't allow spirits to be in your life because it's comforting knowing that they're there, but you just got to be careful as to how open you open yourself up to. Because even the spirits of my grandfather and my family that hang around, they're only here limited times. You know, it's not something that I allow to happen all the time because I don't want to be tricked if it is a trick. It, I'm, I think you and I are a little psychically connected right now because I'm about to ask you a question that you almost just answered, but the topic was there. So here we go. I'm going to try not to get, I'm not going to try and make my whole audience go TMI and tune out. So I'm going to walk on eggshells here, but uh, let's go back in time to when you and I were just reaching puberty. Mm -hmm. uh, puberty hit me really hard. I was just a weirdo, but Okay, I'm just going to throw it out there. Wet dreams. Mm -hmm. When I was a young kid going into puberty, I had some pretty intense ones. Um, now, fast forward to now, the paranormal field. That's where I draw my line because I know then 
when these people say, well, when the spirit first came to me, so loving, so whatever else they want to describe the situation. Now we have the most wonderful relationship and I love this spirit, yada, yada, yada. Um, when they start talking about how physically, sexually, physically, these encounters are usually at night, coming right out of a dream state or even in a dream state, then I start worrying about succubus and incubus. Mm -hmm. And then I have that conversation with them, which usually makes them do this. Now they have a, now, and I've planted the seed and I'm the first one that's going to go on record and say, I'm only human. I make mistakes. And I, and there has probably been many times where I have been tricked, where I thought I was dealing with a, a disembodied human spirit and it was probably a demon tricking me. Mm -hmm. I admit that. Um, how often do you think that happens and how do you prevent being tricked? And what are your personal spidey senses that alert you to maybe there's something trying to trick you here? Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that ends up usually happening is when I walk into a home or a location, if um, there's something negative there or something, you know, demonic or trying to trick me or anything like that, I automatically get jittery and uncomfortable from, I mean, the moment I feel like I'm having panic attacks from the moment I walk into the home. Um, if it's something that's, uh, and when I've had that, it's never steered me wrong. There's always been something with red flags and it ends up being an evil entity that we're dealing with. But if I walk into a home and it's calm and peaceful, I usually have yet to be tricked, I guess you would say. Um, not to say that it wouldn't happen or couldn't happen, but I do typically have that panic attack feel before something switches. And that's kind of like, I had to learn that that was my body telling me, hey, something's wrong and not my having panic attacks. Cause I, uh, growing up, I always had panic attacks. And so I just kind of figured it was natural for me. And so, but to prevent that, I do everything I can to protect myself going in. You know, I don't go in unprotected or, you know, unarmed, I guess you would say. I'm just always, always ready. Well, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm ashamed to say that I haven't been as successful as I would like to have been with some of these cases where the people are just, um, until they start getting actually physically attacked and their lives turn around and they start having the real bad luck and people close to them start having uh, unexplainable uh, accidents or coming under spiritual attack. Usually until that starts happening, they, you know, even though they reached out to me, they don't want to hear that it's time for you to say goodbye mm -hmm. to your, your ghost lover, because it's, you know, it's just not good. And cause I just don't really think, I don't think ghosts do that. Uh, it's usually a more powerful, more malevolent, um, natured type entity that mm -hmm. will do that. I just don't think a disembodied uh, human spirit will do that. So, and um, I mean, it could ha turn in a week. It could be. It could take five, six years. Absolutely. You know, wait till you're absolutely comfortable, and they try to get you when you're off guard. Well, the thing that people don't understand, and you've heard, I know you've heard this term before. I've heard people throw out the term um, uh, vampire, energy vampire. And I know that's a cool term, but in reality, it, it's like that. Mm -hmm. These spirits, it's not like in the exorcist and they can attach to you. And you don't even know over a long years and years and years that you're having basically spiritually your life force sucked out of you. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, that's when you start getting really sick years later because your immune system goes down um, and you're just not of 100% sound mind and body as you were mm -hmm. before this attachment, you know, jumped on you. And so years later, you're, you're, you're making mistakes when you drive. You are not holding the handrail up and down stairs and leaving yourself open to being pushed downstairs. And, um, you know, your, your thoughts aren't there and you start to think evil thoughts about people you once loved more than life itself, even family members, you start having those, you know, uh, you change. So that's what I try to tell people. Right now you may 
be loving life. I mean, mm-hmm. think it's the greatest gift in the world that you have this ghost lover. But I'm telling you right now, years from now, you're going to be coming back to me and it may be too late for me to help you then. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, let's go to another <laughs> fan question here. Oh, this is a good one. I, I thought this one was a great one because I know you're very passionate about it. Is your like I'm lucky enough to have met my wife. It was a blind date, but as soon as we met, I she in talking, I knew she was passionate about the paranormal too, and she's a very gifted psychic, although she doesn't like me to tell people that. So if she sees the show, she's gonna get mad at me. But very sensitive to spirit. I call her my human dowsing rods. If I'm on a case with her, it's much different to have her there than it is if I work the case without her. Yeah. But having said that, is your family very supportive about you? Because you're so good at what you do. Uh, that's important. So mm-hmm. are they? As supportive as they, as they can be. Um, my son, even though he enjoys doing paranormal investigations with me, he calls me a kook. <laughs> <laughs> And that I'm, you know, he jokes, he's like, oh, she's crazy, you know, type of thing and kind of jokes around with it. But he does. He has a blast. And uh, my husband, he's um, as supportive as he can be. He's sitting here right next to me. So he's probably laughing. (laughs) But he really had no opinion of the paranormal before we met. And it was kind of one of those things where he got into it only because he didn't want me going alone to locations. Very cool. Yeah. And we've all, all three of us were featured in uh, Real Haunts Ghost Towns and Real Haunts 3 because they wanted a family of researchers to go and do uh, the documentary. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. Um, So here's the question. When do you feel one's passion for the paranormal might become an unhealthy obsession? That is a good question. Yeah, um, there's two different paths that it could be unhealthy is either people who want to believe so badly that they do everything possible to prove the paranormal instead of just going with the flow. They want to, you know, everything, you know, every orb is paranormal. Every knock on the wall is paranormal. And I also know um, several people who we've done, we've helped with and other people who've helped other cases that like the wife will sit down every morning and do an EVP session with her recently deceased husband. You know, and when you're doing stuff like that, you're not only opening yourself up to something, you know, coming in. It's just it gets to a point where it's not healthy. You're not focused on it anymore. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where it can be unhealthy for people who are so gung ho on disproving the paranormal that their entire life's work is, you know, granted, 90 percent of things can be proven as natural causes. But you have the people that are just so dead set that nothing is paranormal, that they just go out of their way and they become obsessed finding every excuse why it's not. That's very well said. And that's going to lead to my next question. And I'm going to I'll take the hit. I'll, I'll be the one that gets the hate mail for it. But <laughs> while we're on that topic, when it becomes an obsession, let's talk about this question that I got in from George from Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a school teacher in, a, in an old haunted school, Oklahoma. It's all Indian territory. Sometimes the kids get scared, and that's what's troubling. School authorities do not want a paranormal team coming in here or clergy to come in here. Is there anything I can do on the download to help? So you heard me talk about my uh, mm-hmm. advice for this, at least his classroom. But uh, what would you have done if this George had called you? That that's a tough one because in Vegas, I mean, well, you read my book when you did the forward for it. There's a lot of undisclosed locations that I put in there because there are so many places that don't want people to know they're haunted, but they'll let investigators come in. But we have to sign NDAs and we can't shoot video because they don't want it to leak out accidentally. Um, And something with the school, the only thing I could think of with that is either if you can try to reach out to the school and just say, Hey, I'd like to bring a paranormal team in to talk to my students, not so much to do the investigation, but to talk to the students. So they're not scared, you know, education and information is the best uh, element people can use to fight their fears. And if they can at least, you know, help the students. And then once that fear is reduced, like you said, it won't elevate the activity in the room. Excellent, excellent advice. And I I would imagine George is watching. So George, like I said, keep, you know, if you want to reach out to Dr. Heather, you can. Um, Mm -hmm. 
And please keep me posted on how this goes. Because most importantly, it's like if you hadn't even mentioned in the, George, if you hadn't mentioned the kids get scared too, then I wouldn't even been bringing it back up. But that's that's troubling. So you got to be careful with that. On that note, and here's where I'm going to get hate mail. Now, this is after years and years and years of dealing with this. So I'm just going to throw it out there. I, let me take a, a sip of something for this. I have now thrown into a group, a category, all the diehard skeptics that only got into this field because they think we're all kooks. Mm -hmm. And they strictly got in because they're bound and determined to prove that ghosts don't exist and we're all kooks. These diehard skeptics. I am now categorizing all of them as the ultimate trolls. Yeah. Because eventually they all start lashing out and getting mean. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little different than like a, a legitimate licensed parapsychologist who likes to go and debunk the paranormal on cases. They do mm-hmm. that in a, in a different way. And they're, they're like you, they're an intelligent doctor, if you will. And it's, 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 there's something different behind that approach than these people that are just like, think that we're all crazy and, and kooks. And you know, what's funny over the years, far more atheists and people who didn't believe in the afterlife have reached out to me for help than any other type of person, because once it does happen to them, now their whole life is turned around and then they come to you looking for help. I don't judge or get on them about that, but I've had people that I knew, had given a lot of people in our field a hard time reach out to me for help. And I don't say anything. I just, I help them because that's what I do. Mm -hmm. But, um, and you mentioned um, debunking and the scientific method. Let's take um, pseudoscience, which we've been accused of being, Mm -hmm. versus scientific method versus just spirituality. And I'll go out there and start it by saying, I have always felt, still do, and will always feel that what you and I do is a spiritual journey. It's for us to have our wonderful paranormal personal experiences with our friends, go out and have fun, do our thing, communicate with spirit, um, have great ghost stories to tell around the campfire, Um, And it's a spiritual journey. Where do you fall in that? And like some people will not investigate unless they are, they bring a chart with them and they go down Mm -hmm. the list of the, of the, of the um, scientific method. And there's people that say, if you don't do it that way, you're wasting your time and you're not going to further the field. And we're always going to be a pseudoscience. Um, Where, where do your thoughts fall in on all that? It all depends on what I'm investigating. Because when I go like for a client's home, I'll be more, I don't want to say laid back, but I won't be as um, strict to following an outline or anything like that. I'll go with the flow. I'll see how the, you know, the homeowner is and what needs to be done to help the homeowner. Because at that point in time, it's not about advancing the field. It's about helping the client. But when I do other investigations or other research, my ultimate goal, and I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, but my ultimate goal is to make it to where it's not a pseudoscience anymore, because it's no different than when, you know, the theory of relativity was started. Everybody, you know, physicists, chemists, they were all thought that that was a crazy field to get into. But after years of, you know, experimenting and testing and coming up with new ways and moving things forward, it's now an actual science. And I don't think the paranormal is any different because even with like chemistry, you had alchemy, which, you know, brought in aspects of spiritual in there. You know, people believe certain herbs had different powers and, you know, all of that stuff. So I I truly do believe that it's situational based, but I would like to have people stop calling it a pseudoscience because the work that we put into it, if done right, could make it a real science. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Um, And I tell people all the time, I get people come to me and they're, they're, like, I just had this, I just put out 
some of the best evidence I've ever captured on Facebook or on my website or wherever. And I, the people just chewed it up, spit it out, tore it, tore it, my evidence apart and yada, yada, yada. I was there. I know it was, I really caught a ghost and I experienced mm -hmm. it. Um, that's all that matters, man. You don't have mm -hmm. to prove nothing to anybody. Um, if it's going to upset you so much when that happens, don't put your evidence out there because you're not, you're not on a TV show or anything. And, and here's the thing. P you can't change people. Like I said, until something bad happens to them, until this unwanted extra guest that they don't want in their home that they can't see shows up and starts, you know, turning their life upside down and trying to kick them out of their own house. And then they come to me for help until that happens. You're not going to change them. I've been on cases with, I meant, I, just, I can remember that, like it was yesterday being on this one case with a guy who was a legitimate parapsychologist and an atheist and didn't believe in ghosts. And there was a full body apparition appear right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And when it was gone, he immediately turned to me and started debunking what he just experienced. Mm -hmm. And I just, I thought it was the most hilarious thing. I was I, you know, I had to sit down and, and say, let's, you know, I broke open my thermos and had some warm coffee there because we were in a cold, old mansion for all night. And I brought some coffee and I said, let's have a cup of coffee and talk about this. I even invited the ghost to come and have some coffee and pour it a cup for the ghost. But it was like, uh, you can't change some people. And I, I was amazed that I, then I got to thinking as he's talking, I could see his hand was on the table shaking a little bit mm -hmm. and I didn't say anything, but I could tell. Um, and it's funny. I showed up at this home. Those of us, in the, I don't know if you know this home. I don't want to throw out the name of it. I may privately send you a message later mm -hmm. and tell you what, and you're going to know what this, ho what this home is. This home was referred to as the Vegas horror, like the Amityville <laughs> horror, but the Vegas horror, because many things mimic the Amityville haunting mm -hmm. in this home. But I showed up there one night with probably maybe one or two other investigators from other teams, but the guy that owned the home invited about six, seven, eight of us to come. We were like all the heads of different teams that came in there, just a couple other ghost hunters. The rest were like skeptics, debunkers, parapsychologists. And I'm proud to say by the time morning rolled around, I was the only one left still sitting there in the living room. Because everybody, enough weird stuff had happened mm -hmm. that people said, this is a little bit too crazy for yeah. me. I'm, you know, I'm gone. Yeah. Um, including the parapsychologist who did, <laughs> didn't believe, but they, they had to leave. <clears throat> I should have left too, having said that, because once everybody was gone, man, I'm telling you, the psychological attack was so intense that, you know, I, I you know... That's another story you and I can talk about privately, but I probably should have left too. Because, but what? What? So, what do you think about these? Uh, you know, not some people. You just know you're not going to be able to change their mind, and how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's funny because I always say there's nothing. There's no greater feeling knowing that that moment when a skeptic turns into a believer. Just the look <laughs> on their face, and you know what they're going through, and essentially I just, you know, you go with the flow, you know, it's, I've had evidence torn apart. I've had evidence backed up by, you know, different investigators saying, yep, it's right there. That's, you know, exactly what you've captured. And you kind of have to cover your bases. If you don't want to be torn apart like that, like if you do an EVP session, have multiple video cameras shooting it. So that way you can capture that. No, that person wasn't talking you know, whoever you're claiming it. And unfortunately in this field, it's sad. You know, you have the computer trolls and you got to just kind of have thick skin. And, and I trust me, it's hard. Absolutely. When, so when someone criticizes something I've done, I, I just want to throw a pity party and crawl underneath my blanket and just, and hide. But, you know, once you start doing that, you realize this isn't how we're going to advance the field. I had to stop even talking to Sharon about it when that happens to me. And it doesn't happen to me nearly as much as it used to back in the day. But when people attack me, I, I sometimes I would share it with her over dinner or something. She's like so protective over me. Mm -hmm. She she goes on the warpath. So I can't even, 
I can't even talk to her about that when those things happen any longer because uh, mm-hmm. it, it gets very upset. But yeah, you got to really have thick skin. And I finally decided um, the only time I share evidence now is if I can attach it to a personal experience. If I saw something or felt something and it just so happens I also caught it on film or an EVP or, or a still of it, then I'll share it so I can say, well, this is what I experienced while I caught this. If I if I haven't had a personal experience with what I was looking at on film or still, um, I usually just keep put it in a photo album and mm-hmm. I've got plenty of those. But um because there's really no need to. I did get upset one time. Uh, I used to share when I caught uh, photos and footage of malevolent entities, I would share them on some of the really large psychic groups that I belong to. Mm -hmm. And many psychics who have the ability to look at even a photo and have that bad mojo just jump off the picture at them and get on them, Mm -hmm. it would make them physically ill. And I would get a lot of these psychics reach out to me and say, you, you, in some of these groups, you should not show those types of photos. So I stopped doing that. But um, uh, it is what it is. I want to make sure everybody knows everything about you before I have to say goodbye today. You just came out with two new wonderful books. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to the people about your books. Tell them where they can get them. And talk about your website and uh, what's going on with you in the paranormal field. Okay, um, well, the first book came out last fall and it was called Haunted Southern Nevada Ghost Towns. And basically it took everything from Tonopah South. Um, you have Goldfield, uh, personal experiences from investigating those locations. Um, I even included uh, my categorizations for what makes a ghost town. And so that explains why Boulder City is included in there, even though Boulder City is populated and a lot of people live and work there. It's not what it was back in the day. So, and what I liked about my books is I share personal experiences to kind of not make the scarier, but to show that the paranormal field isn't all glamorous like people see on TV. (laughs) And then the newest book just came out on February 13th. And that one is Ghosts and Legends of the Vegas Valley. And someone amazing wrote my foreword for this. Thank you so much. I love it. <laughs> uh, hopefully that helps sell more. You don't didn't need me in there to do the foreword to do that because it's a great book. It's okay. a wonderful book. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and that's not book... just because I did the foreword, but it is. You did. <laughs> you did such a. It was my foreword is heartfelt. You know that, mm-hmm. yep. and uh, you did such a well. You did such a great job on it. I'm just. Mm-hmm. I'm actually a little jealous because you're. <laughs> A a lot of it a lot of it came from the personal investigations that we've done at locations and then of course i did you know your generic google search what's haunted in vegas and instead of going to the standard sites that say this location's haunted i went to places like reddit or you know chat rooms um just to see what people were posting and i did you know I searched on Facebook. And then once I had a location, I then, you know, deep dove into it. If I had time, I, you know, or was at the location, I would just talk to the employees. You know, like one time um, at Madame Tussauds, I was just talking to an employee, chatting back and forth. And he revealed that he saw a spirit of a little short woman in period attire that they truly believe is Madame uh, Madame Tussauds walking around. Wow. I totally forgot that wax museum is here. Yeah. Oh my gosh. See, I never get out anymore. Oh my, that is a <laughs> great place, and it is haunted. And mm-hmm. I totally forgot that was here. And like the Titanic uh, yep. stuff from the Titanic, the, the exhibit is haunted, mm-hmm. and I never go to, and I always forget that's here too. Yeah. Wow. There, there's there's a lot of places, and then I also wanted to include some lesser known places. Um, like I'm like drawing a blank on it, but I included some off the strip hotels that were known locations for suicides and homicides. Um, you know, of course, Tupac's location. And that was mostly just because of that great EVP we captured investigating when someone said, you know, I wish Tupac was here to talk to us. And then we captured, I'm right here, right after. So of course I had, you know, to include that and all the experiences that we had during that um, investigation. And just, it, that one was a lot of fun to work on. And, but now I'm actually finishing it up. I have to have it done. I don't know if I'm going to get done before the end of the month, but um, at least soon. It's Haunted Florida Lighthouses oh, wow. is my next venture. That's going to be cool. I so, love lighthouses. 
God, yeah, I, so, I have and, a weird thing with lighthouses. I love them. Yeah, they're they're a lot of fun, and I just I so many, and there's even a lot of um, faux lighthouses. There's a fake lighthouse in Johns Pass that is believed to have Confederate soldiers walking around it. Wow. And then there's a lighthouse on a lake um, in the center of the state up in uh, Mount Dora. And they actually do ghost tours to the lighthouse because it's extremely haunted. So there, there's a lot of, cool. lot of fun. And um, I do hopefully plan to do several more books about Florida and other states with uh, Arcadia Publishing. They're the ones who do the History Press and the Haunted America series. And that's who my publisher is for those. And so you can get them at Arcadia.com uh, or ArcadiaPublishing.com. Um, they're also available on Amazon or you can reach out to me directly. And I have copies here that I can autograph and ship to you. Oh, that's so cool. So, so cool. Yeah. And your website name. Yep, it's explorationparanormal.com or Yay. we also added a second website link to it. Um, you can go to heatherleephd.com and that oh, takes you to cool. the same website. And that's where I have my blog. Um, recently, I've signed on with RK Entertainment and I'm going to be doing a uh, college lecture series. Hopefully soon we're in the process of putting that together. It was on hold because of my knee surgery and we didn't know when I was having it. But now that that's done and over with and I can travel, um, we're doing that. I'm also working with uh, Flumery Promotions. Hopefully soon he can start getting me into some of the investigations that they do as well as hosting events with them. And of course, I have my Tuesday morning show, uh, Exploring the Paranormal on WLTK Radio. And also every other Wednesday night, I have Ghost Education 101 with my co-host, Philip. That is, and both shows are awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that is so cool. What do we got? Oh, I've got to say goodbye. <laughs> I was going to ask you what's real quick in 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what's more haunted, Florida or Nevada? <sighs> I'm thinking Florida, just because of all the stories that are coming out. Uh, you know, I, I can't dispute that. Anytime I talk to anybody, wherever they live, they say, dude, where I live is haunted, so I'm going to go with where I live. <laughs> I don't I don't dispute yeah. it. I go, well, good, God bless you. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's everywhere now. Florida's got some. Yeah. The East Coast, I think, is more haunted than the West Coast, just because of all the wars and yeah, the history the East Coast has compared to the West. Well, Dr. Heather Lee Landon, you know I love you. You know I respect you. I always have a great time talking with you. If you ever need me for anything, you know you just you know how to get a hold of me. Yeah. Um, have I'm, I'm, like I said, you look so pretty today. You look healthy. You. you look happy. Give your husband a big hug for me, even though he doesn't know me, and that probably think that's a little weird, but give him a hug anyway. <laughs> um, have a beautiful remainder of your Friday evening. Uh, stay blessed, stay you, you're a one of a kind, and um, I'll be reaching out to you. I, you know, I'm going to have you on a couple more times this year. Oh, yeah. I got to pick my spots, make sure you're not too busy, but um, have a great evening and I'll be in touch with you. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. You guys have a great night. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye, bye. Stop before you do anything else. I owe you a dear thank you for joining me on Wednesday. Uh, oh, um, brother. You... you came up, and I know that we're running short, but you know what? I know most of the people whose, uh, whose shows we're on or whose channels we're on, they can live with me for just a second. <laughs> After all, they dealt with me for 22 hours the other day. Yeah, I, you look you... good. For a, that, I'm surprised you're even here today. Well, that's because I'm wearing like a lot of makeup and and I've got like uh, like lines, fishing line coming down. I'm kind of, uh, you know. Well, uh, you got you learned the makeup thing from back in the day when you were the stunt double for Ned Beatty. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So we're John Candy, <laughs> one of the two. But I do want to thank you so much for being my first guest. You know, you were up at one o'clock Pacific time. Um, you joined me for an hour and a half and we had a great conversation and, you know, Sean, the thing is, is that uh, I, I would like to uh, just take a real quick moment. And I want to tell everybody that if they go to communitypayitforward.us, they can still watch all 22 hours. You can even pick them apart. They're in wow. two hour segments. So you can watch every segment. And let's not make this 22 hours a wasted journey. Let's make sure that we watch this and we do something about it. And let's save some lives. 
Very cool. But um, thank you, sir. Yeah, if you feel free, you you've got access to my page. Feel free to share uh, the talk that you and I had to any one of my pages, the Paranormal Ministry page, or um, my my personal profile. Anything you want to do, go ahead. I'll go there and try and find it and share it too. But we had a great talk. I, I loved it. You know, I was your first guest last year when you did it. I'll do it next year if you if you'll have me. And I had a wonderful time. I'm glad I got through the show without becoming a uh, a blithering, crying idiot, which I tend to do when I tell some personal stories. I'm getting better I, at doing that, but um, I didn't got get, me a couple of times. <laughs> I didn't get through the 22 hours without it. I teared up a couple of times, and, and I'm telling you, there are some stories in there that are really going to rip you apart, and if they don't, you need to check no. your pulse. Absolutely. So, thank you, sir. You got it, uh, brother. Thank you to everyone who joined us on Wednesday, and let's keep up this fight. Let's continue to save lives. You can get back to work now, and I'll shut up and go to my corner. <laughs> All right, brother. Uh, he's a cool dude. Um. Thank you all for tuning in. God bless you all. I don't have a show without all you guys. I hope you all uh, have a wonderful weekend. Uh, I will be here this Monday. I don't even have to look and see who it is because it's the last Monday of the month. So you know what that is. It's Happy Medium Monday with the Happy Medium herself, live from Cape Cod, Susan Ahern, here giving free live on-air psychic readings the whole show. And it's the last one for two months because she's having an operation. So she won't be here in March, April or May. She won't be doing Happy Medium Monday. So this coming Monday, whatever the date on that is, uh, the 27th, tune in and get your free psychic reading. Thank you to Zach and Adrian Clayton, my co-producers. Couldn't do the show without them. Communitypayitforward.us. Go there, shop, buy something. All the proceeds go to help people that really need help. My church, or the one that I belong to, usocc.org. If you're interested in knowing about my church, go there. Um, if you're interested in night prayer, which is every weeknight, Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Pacific, or if you're interested in Bible study, which is every Wednesday and Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Pacific, go to bishopjameslong.com, scroll to the bottom of his homepage. The links to both of those are there. And who couldn't use a little more God in their life? Um, thank you to Things Network. Thank you to Temple of Phoenix Rising Entertainment. Thank you to Skeleton Key Network. Thank you to PACT, Little P, capital A-C-T, podcasting all coming together channel for all simulcasting my show. And there's a new one, BeInspiredRadio.net. BeInspiredRadio.net. Chicky Hots Network. She re-airs episodes of the show all day long on Saturdays, if you ever want to go there and check it out. And she's got a lot of cool shows in addition to mine there, too, that uh, you'll love. A lot of old reruns of Art Bell's show. Really, really cool. Okay, it's bad joke time. I'm going to pull a bad joke that one of you sent in out of this haunted Carnival Barker hat. It's my attempt to put a smile on everybody's face before I say good night. What do you call a person with a briefcase in a tree? A branch manager. Good night, Danny. Good night, Jack. Good night, dog. Good night, Harold. Rest in peace. Good night, Ernie. Good night, Bill. Good night, Dan. I love you all. God bless you all. Peace. <laughs>